Okay, so today we're going to basically wrap up the half of the book where we talk about HTML and then next week we'll start to talk about CSS. So we've been waiting to kind of be able to style and make our sites look nice. So that'll be next week. So we're going to finish two chapters today. They'll go pretty fast, I think. Then you're going to have a homework assignment that'll be given out uh, at about 10.30 at the latest. So the homework assignment will be given today and I'll explain it a little bit later and it's going to cover most of what we did in HTML. Then you'll have, of course, tomorrow uh, for the lab day if you come in to work on that and it'll be due on Monday. You have to turn it in on Monday and I'll make it due at the, at the end of our day, our class time on Monday. So by at the latest 11 on Monday, you need to turn this in for full credit. So I'll talk about it after we've done these next two chapters and I'll put that info on Blackboard of course but the first assignment is coming up. To get us started today um, I want to borrow that template that we created. I, I'm, we're kinda done with the whole cookie site for the moment but I want to start another site but not from scratch so in the web design folder remember we've got on 619 we've got that template file copy that template file into a new folder on your desktop with today's date and we'll get started with a template with this template file for today's work on the, fol on the desktop I'm creating a new folder 2017-0620 and I'm copying the template file And in the template file, I'm also putting today's date. So take that template file, copy it to your desktop or flash drive in a folder of today's date, and then the file for today's date. And we'll work with your copy. So with your copy of the file, right click, edit with Notepad++. We'll change a little bit of that comment block at the bottom, and then we'll get started with chapter eight, which starts on 176. Okay, so in the template file, uh, I'll just write chapters 8 and 9, today's date, let's see, wrapping up. Okay, so page 179 and 180 give you an evolution of HTML. Uh, mentioning HTML4 released 20 years ago in 1997. Now HTML1.0 was released in about 1989, so that's 26 years ago that we've had HTML. Then in the early 2000s, 99, 2000, there was going to be a, div uh, a digression or a diversion between HTML and XHTML. So there's a little history there, and then they did go their kind of separate ways. The people behind the language, they kind of went different ways. One group said, let's 
uh, evolve the language this way, another group said let's evolve the language that way. So there was HTML and XHTML for a while. Uh, but then eventually they merged back together. Page 180 mentions HTML5 work in progress. I give you permission to write in the to cross that out in the book instead of work in progress. Write it's here. So this book was written at a time when HTML5 was still there, kind of figuring it out. And this book's already I don't know three years old or something. So it's not a work in progress anymore. It's here. HTML5 is here. It works, uh, and it uh, is ready to go. So HTML5, uh, sometimes the book mentions things like this, um, this, uh, this HTML or this code might not be compatible with every browser, blah, 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 try this. By now, in the year 2017, uh, it's compatible. So I usually skip anything that the book says, uh, try this for older browsers. I just do the latest version of it. I don't. You don't have to memorize. They're called fallbacks and other things. You don't have to memorize other ways to make your code work on older browsers. Older browsers means Internet Explorer 6 or 7. It's on version 11 at the moment. It means, you know, old browser means Firefox 4.0. Well, it's like on version 52 at the moment. Old versions of Chrome mean, you know, Chrome 1. It's on, it's on version 48. So uh, examples where it says old browsers and such, you can just ignore that. HTML5, um, it says HTML5 web page authors do not need to close all tags and new elements and attributes will be introduced. Well, they have been introduced. We've used a few also. At the time of this writing, the HTML5 spec had not been completed, but the major browser makers had started to implement many of the new features and web page authors are rapidly adopting the new markup. So again, think about it in terms of it happened. The code is out there, the browsers support the code. We web designers, web authors, we can use these things. Next page, 181, it's kind of informational. This mentions the doc type. At the very beginning, line one, we did it right the first time. Doc type HTML. We're saying this is the latest version of the code, HTML5. And just for historical purposes, look what you had to write for HTML4. Doc type HTML public dash W3C DDT HTML4 one transitional N dash blah blah blah. Well, that was the old way to specify we're using HTML4. Again, uh, no need to bother with the old code, we're not dealing with old browsers. And then other doc types. Uh, so that's just informational. 182, we already learned that. Comments. If you want to add comments that will not be visible by the user's browser, you can add the text between these characters. So we've used uh, comments a lot to uh, add uh, messages and such, definitions of what the code means. And we also have that comment block at the end of the document. Okay, 183 and 184. For the moment, we will see what this is, but we won't be able to do too much about it until the CSS chapter. So, 183. Every HTML element can carry the ID attribute. It's used to uniquely identify the element from other pages, from other elements on the page. Um, if the uh, its value should start with a letter or an underscore, not a number or a, or a, any other character, it is important that no two elements on the same page have the same value for their ID attribute. Otherwise, the value is no longer unique. So ID, we can add ID attributes to any tag, but they should be unique throughout the whole document. Um, let's say for this project we're going to create a website about our favorite movies. So the title of the document, line 5, my top 5 favorite movies. A 
H1. I'll write the same thing. It's common to write in the title and the H1 the same thing. I'll write a paragraph. I'll say this is a list of my favorite movies. I like them because we can fill that in later or you can fill that in so an h1 that marks the whole document a paragraph that starts to explain what the website will be about and then you can create h2s to start to list some of them we're gonna use this sort of uh, format we're going to have an H2 that is the name of the movie, and then a paragraph for a little bit of text, and it'll be 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Yes, we have ordered lists, the OL tag, to create the numbers, 1 through 5. But the default is that the OL tag goes from 1 to X. It increases. If you want it to count down, you actually have to do some special things. So we're not going to use the ordered tag, we'll just use the headings. So here is where you will then decide, you know, movie number five. And what I'm getting at is, since we're going to have five movies, why not copy and paste that a few times? heading two for each of the numbers, a P where we'll write a little bit of text. This of course, hopefully you write your favorite movie and don't just copy me, although obviously the movies that I will write will be the best five movies of all time. So you don't have to stress it too much. You just write a few movies uh, for the paragraphs of the text. Just write a simple sentence, what the movie is, whatever comes to mind about it. But just we need a little bit of content so that we can do some of the things that, the, that these chapters are talking about.
So again, you don't have to uh, write a whole bunch. Um, just take a little quick moment to write one thing about the movie and then, then we'll go on. Okay, so page uh, 183, uh, we've got some content and if I had a lot of text and pictures and stuff for each of the uh, movies, I would have started to get a longer document. 183 reminds us about the ID tag which we've used before as a way to identify the elements of the screen. I want to use IDs to create um, a navigation, a navigation uh, bar like we've done before, so this will be practice. We're going to add IDs to each of the H2s, and then we're going to create a link to jump down to each of those elements. So, starting with your movie number five to your H2, we'll add an ID. I'll call this movie five. And each H2 will have a unique ID movie 4, 3, 2, and 1. And this is another example. Once you've set it up the right way, you can copy and paste. And one trick here is, since I know I'm going to have this ID on each of the H2s plus a space, remember to copy the space too. Copy the text and the space, copy and paste, and paste, and paste, and it automatically gets the space plus the ID. I know you mentioned putting the ID at the end of the tag. Mm -hmm. Should it go in? Yes, uh, the ID needs to go inside of the tag as the last item in the tag, not the H, not not the slash H2. Oh, okay. It's at the end of the first opening tag. So the rules here of the IDs are saying uh, value should start with a letter or an underscore, not a number or any other character. That's what we're doing here. So a letter and then the number four. If you go on to learn about JavaScript, ID attributes can be used to allow the script to work with that particular element, which we saw previously. A unique identifier has different purposes. Uh, the ID can be used for CSS, as we'll see in a moment, and it can also be used for um, linking, like we're about to do, and it can be used for JavaScript, as we saw last time. It's a very powerful attribute. All right, uh, if I back up, this is a list of my favorite movies, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to say uh, af at the end of that line, break and then we will write um, and we'll write it like this number 5 number 4 number 3 number 2 number 1 this is a simple nav bar that is going to let us jump down to the different sections and we'll talk about it a little bit later in the book but we also have a tag special tags to define the sections of the document and such and we'll use it now at the moment we have a tag called nav a tag that is all about a nav bar this works without the nav tag but this is a little more correct because with the nav tag we're marking this is a navigation bar Here then is the part that will be a little redundant. We need to add the A tag with an href to each of these. So the syntax is this A tag wrapped around the number, href somewhere, and then copy and paste that to each of these and the closing tag.
We've got a nav bar in the nav tag. We've got each of the items that will be a link. And don't forget to close the link. I copied and pasted the start of the link, but I need to end the link. Again, I'm turning off autocomplete, so the tag did not close. I have to close it manually. Using the IDs, we can then complete this. We need to specify the pound symbol and then the ID that we're trying to jump down to. So movie 5. Pound movie 5. Pound movie 4. The name of the ID. The ID attribute is known as a global attribute because it can be used on any element. So we've applied IDs here. Save it and run it. And you should see you've got your top five list. that. My top five favorite movies is a list of my favorite movies. We'll fill in the, le the rest later. I want to jump straight to number one and click on that. The screen scrolls down. Now again, it, it won't scroll all the way down unless your window is kind of small like that so that there is space for it to move down. So if I click on number one, it jumps down. But it's not going to scroll all the way down to have number one at the top unless there is content further down to push it up. So if you've got your screen completely maximized like that, most likely you won't really see any movement because the screen's already, everything is showing. Question? Let me check your work one moment. Just one moment. Let me answer this. So did that work for everyone? Anyone? Any a little help? Uh, you need to have this.
starting point here. Um, nav bar, various elements. You click, it jumps down. If your screen is completely maximized, it doesn't move very much. That's normal. OK, so we've seen this before, but it's very important to understand what we're doing here. We're creating an ID, adding it to an element. It's a unique identifier. We saw the importance of that yesterday for JavaScript. We've seen it twice for the importance of using it as a navbar link. And in a little bit, we'll also use it for the importance of CSS. Before we do that one, we'll check on page 184 and mention classes. A class is like the opposite of an ID in that it can be used, the same one, on multiple elements. Right now, IDs are uniquely identifying each of those items. They have to be unique in order for us to jump down. A class is great when we use CSS. I would like every one of these heading twos to look a certain way. That's CSS. So we'll do a little CSS, and we'll apply that CSS to all five of those at once. Now, when we've done CSS before, we added the style attribute. We can do it more efficiently with the class attribute. So we've got ID, and then we've got class. So on each of these H2s, I'm going to add a class. And I said before, I like to add IDs names and classes as the last attribute of the tag. We saw that in the form, that the, a form can have an attribute of type, an attribute of placeholder, an attribute of whatever, but then ID at the end, or name, or class. So IDs and class. The class then, the book says 184. Sometimes, rather than uniquely identifying one element within a document, you will want a way to identify several elements as being different from the other elements in the page. So all of these are kind of going to be grouped together with the same class. We'll say uh, h2style. Should have copied and pasted when it was complete. But all of these have the exact same class. Different ID, but the same class. We're sort of grouping them together so that we can edit all five of them at once with CSS. We previously added the style attribute to edit an individual element. With class, we can edit them all at once. The way we do that is, let's back up to line 6. Give yourself a new line 6 and create a style block. Now, in this block, I will make all my CSS rules, all my CSS definitions, and they will apply everywhere that I've added a class. So we've got H2 style. Notice I did a capital S on style. In the style block, then we will write dot H2 style. Just like we have the pound symbol, which basically means this is an ID. ID. We have the dot, which means this is a class. Class. So no dot here. You'd be saying class class h2. We have a dot here to delineate or to mark it as a class. Right here we don't have we don't have a pound sign here. That'd be id id would be fine. That means id. That means class. You write it out. You write it out in the body, and then you use the shorthand the dot. Then we're using the opening and closing curly braces. We saw that when we wrote a function in JavaScript, but we also use it here in uh, CSS. I'm going to back up, comment, a CSS style block. Consolidate all your CSS rules all your CSS code or definitions. This 
syntax is known as embedded CSS. Better than inline. We were doing inline CSS previously. Inside the style block, use this kind of comment tag to create comments. JavaScript. And we'll get into all the details about how to write JavaScript, I mean uh, CSS, properly in the next coming chapters, but at the very least what I'll do here is we've got, we're about to say all of the heading two styles will be controlled the same way with this CSS rule. I'm going to break the curly braces into separate lines. This is just for readability. I can keep that in one line, keep it in one line, but I like to break these curly braces. This is the syntax, the, your CSS rule, curly braces, and then the further properties and values. So here's an easy one. Background dash color pink. Save it and run it. And now everywhere where that class is used should inherit this background color definition that we've written. It'll be a beautiful shade of Pepto-Bismol. There you go. All five of your numbers should then become exactly the same. Embedded CSS by using a class which is which is related to the ID. We've attached CSS more efficiently to everything at once. Yeah, we had to take the moment to attach or write the class on five things. But once that is written. Now all we have to do is deal with this. So we've got a background color. We also had learned um, color. So on the next line, we do white. Now all of them change at once. You can choose your own perfect colors, of course. We've got background color, text color. You save it and run it, everything changes. Let's pause it there. Did that work for everyone? Did everyone get their colors to change on everything?
All right, so based on this idea, we have the ability to then say, okay, I want each of the um, paragraphs to be the same color. Right now, the color of the paragraphs is the same, black and white. So if I wanted each of those paragraphs to also change, I need to do the same thing. I need to add a class to each paragraph and make up the class and then define what it should look like. So let's go into each of those paragraphs. We'll add a class attribute. We'll say uh, P style. Now these classes and IDs, you can make them up yourself completely. And you should name them something that makes sense to you as you write your code. Off the top of my head, this makes sense to me at the moment. Whereas anything that is in H2, this is its style. It's very common to write something like H2 style blue. So I can tell right away in my code up there, H2 style blue will mean that everything that is in H2 styled with this will become blue. You can make these names as long as you want, but again, you have to type them yourself. So perhaps make them compact, memorable, that makes sense. So then you're going to copy that class and add it to all of your five paragraphs. And it takes that effort to think of the class name, write the class attribute, add it to all five. But once you've got that, you can go back to your style block and now say dot uh, p style. Spell it exactly the same. Uppercase p, lowercase p is different. And then here, we'll do background color uh, I'll make it backwards this is a this is a trick if you use the same colors as before but just reverse them plus we'll do one more thing with let's say uh, 250 px we can also define the width and the height of elements in CSS and here I'm saying the width of the paragraphs will be 250 pixels. So now instead of that paragraph going all the way off to the side, it only is about 250 pixels. Not about exactly 250 pixels. Cuts off the word and it goes there. And the color extends only that far. So we probably want to be able to do a lot more things via CSS right now. The chapter's coming very soon. This is what I want to say, and then we'll move on regarding <coughs> IDs and uh, classes. We can use IDs for links. We can use classes for CSS. We can also use IDs for CSS, but I don't want to quite touch on that yet. So we'll move on. Any questions on IDs and classes? OK, uh, page 185, 186. Block level elements and inline level elements. Some elements will always appear to start on a new line in the browser. These are known as block level elements. Examples include h1, p, ordered list, unordered list list item. So the example on 185 just shows you. Every time you use those examples of those tags, they, they start on their own line. And we've been doing that already. This h2 starts on its own line. It pushes the other line away. p tag does its thing. It pushes the other line away. We have also looked at inline elements, 186. Some elements will always appear to continue on the same line as their neighboring elements. These are known as inline elements. The examples include the A tag, links, bold, emphasis, and image. So P here is pushing away the other elements. It takes up its own block. But the A tag doesn't. It stays on the same line. 
5 doesn't suddenly appear on its own line, 4 or 3. So inline level elements, block level elements. Uh, as you learn the tags, it will kind of tell you this is block level, this is inline. And the point of that is to be able to further control your, your project. So this is just something to make a note of. 185, 186. Block level inline. You see a little graphic about it. It's just informational for the moment. And then, <coughs> then we've got 187 on the undercover tag right here. Grouping text in elements in a block, the div tag. This is a very common, very popular tag. The div element allows you to group a set of elements together in one block level box. Div or division, we divide up the document into different pieces. Let's say, top five favorite movies, and then um, on the same page, we're going to have top oh, we're going to have bottom 3 worst movies so your 3 most hated movies and your 5 most loved movies well before we start to make that let's back up heading 1 here all of this is a block is an element the 5 movies and the h1 i'm going to put a div tag i'm dividing all of this as a block of content and then another div as a second block of content so let's add div and then slash div before h1 after the paragraph div div and then slash div and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to indent all of the stuff in between to show that it's related. I don't remember if I mentioned it in this class, but did I mention that if you select lines, they can all be tabbed at once? OK, so select all those lines and tab them at once. So I see visually, as I look at my code, uh, div slash div. All of this is a section, so to speak, of that div. I'm doing that so that I can create a, um, a new div where I can do my H1, my bottom three least favorite movies. a div for the best ones and a section for the worst ones. In a browser, the contents of the div element will start on a new line. But other than this, it will make no difference to the presentation of the page. So div is a block level element. It creates a new line. It takes up a new block. But visually, besides that, it doesn't look anything special. Again, using an ID or a class, on the div, however, means that you can create CSS rules to indicate how much space and other attributes can be added. Okay, so here just take a quick moment to to create these three to write about these three terrible movies. I'm only saying three movies because we want to increase the piece. I want five good ones and three bad ones. Don't stress too much about the bad ones. Let's 
just so many to choose from. So uh, some uh, movies there, and okay, so we've got the, the top five ones, you know, we should create a nav bar, sure, we can figure that out later. Then we've got the top five movies, so then if you scroll down, there's the bottom three. Visually, it doesn't look that uh, different, uh, but we're dividing them into different sections with div. Well, what we can do with this is write some CSS. If we give each of these divs a unique identifier, then we can write some CSS code to visually separate them. So let's back up here. I'm going to say for the div of the bad movies, ID, we'll say uh, bad movies. And then for the div of the good movies, I'll add an ID good movies. identifier to so your bad movies section. It's a section because it's been divided from each other. Div. ID good movies, ID bad movies. And then in CSS, we can style, we can target or control that whole block. Okay, so the way we then target these in uh, the CSS block is to mention the ID and then just add the style. The way you mention the ID is we were using dots for classes. And we've seen this before. We're using the hash mark, hash mark for, for ID. That needs its curly braces. And then inside of the curly braces, we write whatever we want. So I'm controlling the whole thing at once. Let's say um, background color for the good movies, azure. And then for the bad movies, uh, red. Yes? So do you do like the hashtag when you're referring to something in div? Well, we're going to say as a comment, uh, ha hashtag or hash mark, hashtag for IDs, and then dot for classes. So it's not that I, I'm targeting specifically the ID. It's wherever, I mean the, the div, wherever I've got an ID, we use the hash mark. Is it, is it incorrect then? No, style can be applied anywhere, but it's not the best way to do it. It's the fastest way to do it, but this is a better way. Put all of your CSS rules in one location 
so that we can quickly get back and edit them later. If we apply style in every spot, we have to go to every spot to make the change when we want to change it again later. So this is all consolidated. Dot. Right, four right. Points. I'm talking about in the div tag. Mm -hmm. We could put like, style and then refer back to the top. No, style, if you, if you add the attribute of style, you're adding CSS at that point to the div. Uh, you want to add IDs or classes so that you can consolidate that back here. So you need to specify the name of the ID or class, not style. So we use a dot for classes. We use the pound sign, hash mark, uh, hash symbol, the number symbol for IDs. And now wherever there's a unique identifier of good movies, we give it this background color. check your result. It's a very, very, very light blue. You can see it on my projector. But everything in that div of the good movies gets a nice soothing blue color. So we've said background color for the whole div of good movies, blue. Background color for the div of all the bad movies, red. So we can then clearly see the divisions. Right there, the div starts and ends on H1 and ends on that paragraph. And then the next div starts and ends right there. So divs are invisible containers, basically. They are containers. They are block level containers, block level elements. A div divides sections. And then applying classes or IDs we can style with CSS. Page 188, grouping text and elements inline. So the related classes are related to IDs. I would call them the two sides of the same coin. Then we've got span and div. That's two sides of a different coin. Div and span. Div is a block level element that is used to group or select something, as we saw here. Then we've got span, which is very similar, but the contrast is that it's an inline level element. In my case, I have the same word twice. I wrote on my best movies, number one, Star Wars and New Hope. My worst movies, controversy, I wrote Star Wars The Force Awakens. So I want to have the word Star Wars here and here as to style via CSS. So I want to target the word Star Wars in both places. This is where the span tag comes in. Div divides the whole content apart from each other because it's block level. Span is inline level. It's not going to separate the content, but I can use it to target two elements at once. Let's go to your code, and it, this will work best if you've got you know the same word uh, in two places. I did it this way. I want to put the span tag around Star Wars in both of these sections. If you don't have the same word, that's fine. Just select two words, so like this. In Star Wars, I'm going to add a span span tag. I'm setting us. I'm setting it apart. Star Wars here. This this uh, is an inline level element, and then I'll do the same thing for when I mention Star Wars in the bad movies. So this has been marked as something special. Span. They will have a span. Then now using a class, I can then set up CSS to target them both just like I had added 
class to to heading one through five. So class, we'll say um, SW for Star Wars. These, of course, can be named anything you want, and probably I wouldn't usually call it so simply as SW because if I put down this code and come back to it a week later, I'm going to forget. What is, what is SW again? I should call it something more meaningful like span Star Wars or span red color. <clears throat> this will be good enough because then <clears throat> I can create a CSS rule called dot SW and start to target those two instances of that span. So if we go back to my style block, dot SW. Just to make it obvious, most of these colors are really bad, unless you look up good colors. Blue. This is a class, so dot, and then I can control it in various ways. So everywhere that the term Star Wars appears, it gets that styling. These are a division of a big chunk of content. Spans are a division or a delineator of a little bit of content. These spans both have a class and have defined the class in the CSS. Both inherit styling. actually use one of your one of your previous classes for the same I could but I defined I can reuse the same classes as before yes but I uh, already defined those classes to look a certain way you know the class that I have previously uh, pink and brown if I attach pink and brown to here and here this is already pink and brown so it won't really look different it'll look different here it's on a red background, but again, pink and brown on a on a azure background is going to look exactly the same. And we will see uh, why I said previously HTML is the easy one, CSS is a little harder, and JavaScript is the hardest one. The difficulty of CSS is to figure out how should I set this up, what rules should I create? Is it going to be an ID? Is it going to be a class? Do I need to combine them? What should I name it? Oh, this is now affecting something else. We'll see that CSS is like a puzzle, that you change one thing and something else changes. So as we get to the CSS chapter starting on Monday, we'll start to understand it more. So that's a, that's a span. Let's pause there. Did that work for everyone? You've styled, you've made a really ugly looking document, but that's OK. You might not have a degree in graphic design like me. And uh, if you go to various websites, you can get color combinations and color formulas. I just show some random colors and it shows, but I've got different colors. So uh, anyone need a, any help? Is it working properly for everyone? OK, so iframes, line, uh, page 189. We can embed a website in a website. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, we can make links here to go off to one of these links on a website. But what I want to do is instead embed the other website here. A person doesn't have to leave this website to see the other website. So let's say I want to link to the Wikipedia article about one of these movies. What's that? Army of Darkness. Army of Darkness, all right. Let's go look at the Wikipedia article of one of your favorite movies. 
we're going to borrow its link. Uh, let's set up our code and then we'll add the link, page 189. We use the tag called iframe. An iframe is like a little window that has been cut into your page. And in that window, you can see another page. The term iframe is an abbreviation for inline frame. OK, so let's set up the iframe tag, and then we'll add the proper link. Let's say for in the block of the Army of Darkness, in my case, number 3, I want to add an iframe. So in my code, finding number 3, I've got a paragraph, and below that, I'll create another paragraph. And inside of that, I'll create iframe. iframe is inline. So I'm first separating it with a p tag. p tag is block level. So now this iframe is separated from the previous paragraph. Block level element, There's nothing in between the actual tags. You don't put anything between the tags, but you put a bunch of attributes. The most important one is a source, the link. So I'm going to go. You're going to go to the web browser, go to Wikipedia, and find the article about your movie. Then you're going to copy the address and paste it into the source. So wikipedia.org. Look up. your movie and then just copy the link find the link copy the link paste it into source that's the most important attribute but we should also specify well how big are we gonna make this little window to display this website. Therefore, we need a width and a height attribute. I'll say 640 by 480. So if I run that inside of my project, in the middle of uh, one of my entries, I have a little window where I'm displaying the, the iframe. Now I made a little typo. I wrote iframe, and then I closed my tag frame. That was my mistake. It's open iframe, close iframe. Because what I saw when I checked in the browser, suddenly the rest of my document disappeared. So I, 543, and then the rest disappeared. Whoops, I forgot to close my iframe tag. So slash iframe. Let's take a look. So what should happen is this, that you've got your numbers, then the iframe, then the rest.
this opens up a website in my website. That's what we get. We can play with these values here. Um, they could do 480, 640, that way it looks tall. Tall or wide. And um, then you've got the site that appears. Appears on the screen. Now we can do a little trick here, just one moment. Uh, we we can load the the mobile version if you have the mobile address, and we can get that somehow. Okay, yeah. So if you do this, if you on Wikipedia, if you do, you've got your address for your article. If you've gone to Wikipedia, you have something that looks like this: en.wikipedia.org, etc. If you do en.m.wikipedia, that'll load the mobile version of the Wikipedia article so that it kind of removes the sidebar and that other stuff that is not quite necessary. So en.m for mobile, dot Wikipedia. And it'll look like this, so the mobile version. Yeah. It wanted to show the desktop version, but we've got a much smaller space. So by forcing it to the mobile link version, it looks a lot better. Page 190 also mentions you can add a couple more attributes. The scrolling attribute to be able to scroll around or not. The frame border attribute and the seamless attribute. Uh, I wouldn't worry about those too much. These are the ones that we definitely need. Source, width, and height. Besides that, like seamless, uh, it removes the scroll bars, but that works best if you're on a mobile device. You don't want to see the scroll bars on a mobile, you just want to scroll with your finger. Frame border is mentioned that it's not, you no longer want to really do that one in HTML5, so we'll skip it. Page 191. Information about your page. Meta tags. The meta element lives inside the head element, or block, and contains information about the web page. It's not visible to users, but fulfills a number of purposes, such as telling search engines about your page, who created it, and whether or not it, it's time sensitive. The meta element is an empty element, so it does not have a closing tag. But it uses attributes. We've got some already here. Meta tag car set UTF-8 we're saying the character set that we can use here is basically all the special characters uh, other ones that are listed here description keywords robots author pragma and expires let's add a meta tag of description this is going to describe your page uh, there's a whole concept and we have a whole class about search engine optimization. I think it's CIS 250, 257 or maybe 255. So we teach a class, you make a cool website and you need to learn all about getting people to find your website, getting traffic, getting that sweet internet fame. And that's what that class is about, how to get found online. And one of the things we talk about there is adding this meta tag of description so that the search engines find you, so that Google, when someone does a Google search, they find your site. So after meta, car set, we'll add another meta tag. But this one has an attribute of name and an attribute of content. We're going to add two meta tags, so I'll just copy that. We have 
have car set that has one purpose, the character set. We have other meta tags that different, have different purposes. What's the name of the meta tag and what's the content? This first meta tag, we're going to say description. The name of this meta tag is description. This describes this page. And right here you can write my list of the best and worst movies. For SEO purposes, search engine optimization, to get found when someone Googles something, this could be a keyword or a phrase of what people are Googling. You know, if you have a blog or a website all about reviews of movies, someone searches for review of Wonder Woman. You know, they're searching for a review of a movie. If you put in your description these terms that people may be searching for, this is one way to help you get found when people search. That's a class with a lot of nuances, so that's not the only way to get found online, but it's one of the ways. And then this next one, meta name author, who created the site. This is another thing that the search engines can see. So let's say you are writing articles and people want to look up your articles. They wrote, you know, Star Wars Movie Review by Victor Campos. Well, it's got the keywords in the meta tag here to help me get found. These are the meta tags that are mentioned here. You can look at them on your own. These are the only ones we need at the moment. And I think I mentioned previously, doing something like this is just for aesthetics, because uh, the white space doesn't matter to the browser. And I kind of like to do this, keep them lined up nicely. That, just a few spaces or tabs to line them up. One ninety three, one ninety four. Um, let's say we wanted to add special characters like a copyright at the bottom of my page. At the very end, I want to add copyright and your name. So at the very end, I want to add a copyright section and the symbol of copyright. Page one ninety three and ninety four mention a very small amount of what are known as escape characters. These are special characters. And there's a bunch of others that we can look up online. Let's say we want to add a copyright notice at the bottom of our site. We'll go back to our body. And at the very end, let's create a new div, a new division. Paragraph there. Copyright 2017, your name. There are some characters that are used and reserved by HTML. For example, the left and right angle brackets. Therefore, if you want these characters to appear on your page, you need to use what are termed escape characters, also known as escape codes or entity references. So if you wanted to use the less than symbol, you know, if I wanted to say something like, you know, less than, this is going to confuse the browser because we've used the less than symbol everywhere else for code. And I don't want this to be code. I want the less than symbol. We have here li listed ampersand LT semicolon. That will create the less than symbol, but not use it as code. That doesn't make sense here, but I'm just showing you. This is what this part of the book is saying. Some special characters need to be escaped, meaning you have to write them in a special way. If I didn't write 
write the special character, it would try to process that code. What I want to do is a copyright symbol. So we have ampersand, pound sign, 169, semicolon. That creates a copyright symbol. Page 194 mentions other special characters, um, you know, something like made for made made for 99 cent. The cent symbol will appear here. of special characters using, uh, using ampersand sent semicolon that will become the special character. We have a bunch of these special characters. become a heart. The book mentions here on page 193, you can find a more complete list of escape codes in the tools section of the website of this book. At the very beginning of the book, it tells you that the website for this book is htmlncssbook.com. If you take a quick look in your browser, if you go to htmlncssbook.com, that's the website of this book. Go to Extras and Tools. Escape Characters. So here it shows you all of these symbols that you could create. Hover over your chosen symbol, the escape code pops up. So if I need to use one of these math symbols, I need to write three and a half years. Well, I can use either ampersand pound 189 semicolon or ampersand frac 12 semicolon and write this character in two different ways. Officially, it's known as vulgar fraction one half. It's funny. Multiplication sign, less than sign for all partial differential n -ary, n -ary product. Cool. Oh, okay, these are a couple of Hebrew letters. Hearts, clubs, micro sign, degrees. Maybe I'm trying to do today it is 80 degrees, which is also known as the masculine ordinal indicator. Ampersand ordum. Anyway, that's the website of the book, htmlncssbook.com. There's a few symbols we added in. You can also do a Google search, look up HTML escape characters. You'll see a huge list. The, book does, the book's website doesn't mention them all, but we can access even more of them. And that ends uh, this chapter, the extra markup chapter. We're putting together a website with uh, some brand new tags. Some brand new tags like the iframe, very cool. We're starting to look more at CSS. Those are IDs and classes. 
divs and spans. These are more pieces of what we'll be working with extensively later. That's our site so far. We'll have one more chapter, then we'll wrap up. Any questions on this chapter of extra markup? Okay, chapter 9. This is a chapter about multimedia, video and sound. There's a lot that we're going to skip in class. You should look at it on your own. But starting on page 203, it mentions Flash, which is a classic animation software, now known as Adobe Animate. And talks about the history, talks about a timeline. Great, adding Flash Movie to your website. You can look at that on your own, page 207. Understanding video formats using hosted video. So it's very theoretical for a lot, and then it'll be, then it'll show us exactly what to do. But it's talking about different video formats like DVD format, AVI, QuickTime, etc. Plugins. So we want to add a video. We're going to add a video, a trailer to one of these movies. And the book is saying we can do it a couple of ways. We can have the video file in our project. So we can have the actual video file in the folder of our project, just like we had an image. But much more common instead is to link to a video on a hosted video service, which is on a website, like YouTube. Or, you know, we can embed a video, we can even embed a live video, like something out of, uh, you know, twitch.tv or, or uh, Vimeo or whatever. So we're going to put a web we're going to put a video on our website that is from another website. The book talks about converting the video, don't even worry about that. HTML5 preparing video, adding video. Really the this whole chapter is like way too complicated. It's way easier to embed video and audio to your site than this whole chapter. Let me show you how. Let's say we're going to do a YouTube video. Go, go ahead and open a, video, a, a, link, a, a window to go to YouTube and try to find the trailer of one of your movies here. scare anyone but I'm gonna put a scary movie trailer here the original 19 the original Halloween Ooh, it's the restricted one everyone's at least 17 here right So let's say you find your video from YouTube. If you look below the video, not so far down that you see those comments, never go there. What you want to do is right before the description of the video, you'll see a button that says share. Click the share button and almost every YouTube video has this, share. If it's not there, it's not there. You have to do it in a different way. But when you click share, you get share link and you get embed. Embed is a little bit of HTML code that you can copy and paste into your website. So all you have to do is copy that and paste it into Notepad++ wherever you want this video to appear. So I wrote in my movie, it's number number two. I'm going to create a new paragraph in the number two section and then paste the code it gave me. Oh, well, look at that. It's an iframe with and height and source and other attributes. So YouTube itself basically 
is giving me an iframe code with the proper link to embed the video in your site. Well, that'll work. The thing is one better. The thing, huh? That is a very good one. I mean, the original thing, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the thing from the 50s I'm talking about. <laughs> the 80s, then. Okay, so iframe, and when you run this code, you have now the video embedded in your site. Okay, so from YouTube, uh, I embedded a video on my site. If you look in YouTube, you have a few other things you can do. Show more. You get a preview, and you get some options. What's the size of my video? Let's say I want it bigger, smaller. Let's say I want it at 1280, 720p show suggested videos. Did you see when I played my video and I paused it, it's also showing other videos. Maybe I don't want that. I only want it to show the video. So I can turn off show suggested videos. It won't show other videos besides that video. Player controls. I have the ability to fast forward, rewind it, change the volume, all of that. If I don't want that, I just want the pause and play, I can say, okay, don't show the player controls. This is going to show the title of the video. I don't want that, just the video. So to really simplify it down, I can turn all of those off. And then you have privacy mode, which is that it, it, won't, uh, it won't put the tracking cookie like it usually is there. So if I just simplify it down here, make the video bigger, the code has changed. So I need to copy that different code and behind the scenes it's doing something to to change it so now here it's really big too big and then I don't have the other controls I press play well, it's not supposed to show that but whatever so it's uh, it's embedded their video is on my site. That's the big idea of this chapter. This, this, this chapter, I think, is the one that's really out of date for this book because it has changed so much online. Uh, almost every website now has some sort of embed code. Here's another example. Let's say, uh, have you heard of the site SoundCloud? It's like the YouTube of audio. This is where people are creating accounts to upload their music. Uh, it's free, like YouTube as well. So let's say I find, I find some music here. I can embed the music as well, the sound. Here's an example. If you don't want to search around too much, I have a an account here. I like to. Uh, one of my hobbies is that I, I like to read and collect comic books. I've been doing it since like I was I was like 10 years old, and I have a podcast here. Every week, I upload a, a little podcast about a comic book that I'm reading. So I have an account here, soundcloud.com slash vmcampos. And let's say I wanted to embed uh, an episode, this audio, in the HTML. You will see, like, let's say I'm playing uh, this one. I want this episode of Batman. So you have share many many multimedia sites nowadays have a share button and 
and that share button is going to give you the embed code. Share embed. You have more options, size and, and all of that, and there's the code, and it's basically an iframe. So it doesn't relate to this site, but just at the very end, I'll, I'll put it here. You don't have to do this, but at the very end, I'll just add this just to show you if you get embed code from a multimedia site, copy and paste, you'll have, you'll have that multimedia added to your page. So that's an audio file that has been embedded into this page with the embed code. Other sites, almost every site has an embed code nowadays, right? Uh, Twitch.tv, go find a good stream of someone playing a game. Uh, you should then find the embed code, copy and paste it into your page, and then you'll have um, that playing on your site. Okay, so here like on Twitch, it's under share, and then I click there and channel link embed code. There it is. So I can copy that, paste it into my site, and then that will show up on my site. So basically, look for the embed code on any of these sites to then copy and paste that code to use it on your site. Page 214 is where we actually had our own video. Yeah, but I would still recommend, so the book does mention how to add your own video that you have in the in the folder, yes, but I would still recommend instead upload your video to YouTube, upload your sound to SoundCloud, upload your stuff to some site that's online because those multimedia sites have some of the best servers and the best connections on the internet. So your video is going to be very safe for it to be up there for people to connect to it. You know, if I upload my video to my site, my site may crash with all of the traffic of people watching it. So if I'm uploading it to YouTube, you know, YouTube's not going to crash, really. So uploading it to one of these multimedia sites is often better, and that's what I would recommend. So that's a pretty fast chapter because we're skipping it all. Just get the embed code from the proper website and add it to your, your page. So that's what our site is right there, and uh, we're wrapping up that chapter, chapter 10 next time, Introduction to CSS. So we've gone uh, about halfway through the book. This has all been HTML. There's still other tags. There's still other tags that we could learn, but again, you don't need to know every single tag. You don't use every single tag. You can uh, further learn on your own but we've learned enough of what is necessary to then be pretty productive. The rest of the chapter will be a lot of CSS. Well, how do I make that paragraph styled a certain way? How do I make columns? How do I change colors, drop shadows? We're going to see then CSS is all about the design of things. Our site uh, is going to be designed a lot better. So we're going to wrap up at this point, and then I'm going to talk about the homework. Any questions on anything we talked about today so far? Okay, so let's talk about the homework.